When did you surrender your life to Jesus and why? I surrendered my life to Jesus about seven and a half years ago. Um, the reason why I surrendered my life to Jesus were for two reasons. Um, the first reason why I surrendered my life to Christ was because I had found that the Bible was true. And because the Bible is true based upon the various prophecies that it contains and how God actually says that I am God and you can know that I'm God because I can tell the future. Jesus says in John chapter 13 and verse 19, Behold, I tell you beforehand so that when it comes to pass, you might believe that I am the Son of God. And so in the fulfillment of these prophecies, they compel us to accept Jesus at what he claimed to be. And that was God on earth. The second reason why I surrendered my life to Jesus is because I found in him a friend that I could find nowhere else. I found in him help through the most darkest times in my life. Um, I remember I had a really bad habit. Um, some years ago, I was in a relationship and we were, we were being physically intimate and fornicating prior to being married. And so as a result of that, I knew because I was just reading the Bible that this was wrong. And so, but I found myself, even though I knew it was wrong in my mind, I did not have the desire to stop and I didn't have the power to resist the temptation when it would come. But there was on one particular occasion where I was tempted to engage in fornication, to sleep with this, this woman who was not my wife. And I had prayed in my heart that God would give me power to obey his commandments and to live that life. And what I found was as soon as I had prayed and was completely dependent upon Jesus, he gave me power to resist the temptation, took away all my sexual desire from that situation, and I walked away still faithful to him. And that's how I knew that Jesus has power to save people from any temptation, from any circumstance. And for me, that is the most compelling reason to believe in Jesus. Buddha didn't do that for me. Allah didn't do that for me. Gandhi didn't do that for me. I mean, you could just think of all the other religions that exist. None of them promised such deliverance. But Jesus did promise it, and Jesus has provided it for me. Okay. What inspires you about God the most? I think the thing that inspires me the most about God is that God is not just a God of the large. He's not just a God of the enormous. Yes, he created the universe. You have the stars, the galaxies. They say that there's about 400 billion galaxies in the universe that we know of. Uh, to travel to one of them would take you years traveling at the speed of light. Um, but the fact that God is a God of the small, of the minute, of the little things. And sometimes in this universe, as a human being, you feel so small. You feel as if you are nothing. But what you find is God puts so much creativity, so much energy in design, even in the smallest atom. That when you study chemistry, you see how the elements work, you see the shape of an atom, you have to be fascinated. You have to be just enthralled to see what kind of intelligence it took to create these things, DNA. I mean, it's just amazing things. And so for me, the fact that God is a God of small things, and that whenever we feel small, whenever we feel like we are nothing, that we're, we're literally like an atom, like a molecule, people don't notice you. <laughs> they don't notice molecules, they don't notice atoms. God says, I notice. And he pays attention to the small things. And that inspires me to do the same. To not overlook the small people. Not to overlook the little things in life. But to really pay attention to the small details. Because there may be a deeper message in those things than necessarily the stars or the galaxies. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says, Therefore, if any man be in Christ... He is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Now, there may be so much baggage in your life, and I know there was baggage in my life, and it feels like the whole world is just weighed on your shoulders. Do you want to say, if this is a real experience, if you can actually provide this experience, God, I invite you to come into my life and transform me into the person of Christ. Mahadis Gandhi said one time, I like your Christ, but I do not like your Christians. So even those who do not even have the experience of Christ admired the life of Christ. And this life can be yours 
if you are willing to let him in. Now because Mahas Gandhi said, I like your Christ, but I do not like your Christians, it just shows that the life in which a Christian lived must be based on what Jesus lived. Because he even saw the distinction with some Christians who said they are Christians, but they did not live the life of Christ. But because of Christ and his word, as you follow him, he will then show you how to live and then you will be just living as Christ lived. But it just comes to show that somebody who was not even of the faith still admired the life of Christ. So now under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, what progress will you make? John chapter 16 verse 13 says, Howbeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak. And he will show you things to come. So the Holy Spirit is the one who will lead you into all truth, as we mentioned. And this is why we mentioned earlier that we are not to refuse the voice of the Holy Spirit, because we are then saying we don't want the truth. But as the Holy Spirit shows you into all truth, gradually, you become changed step by step. John chapter 8 verse 32 says, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now, I just want to emphasize one small point. If we really want to know the truth, the Spirit of God is willing and ready because Jesus' life paid the penalty of sin so you can be free. All you have to do is simply ask for the Holy Spirit to reveal truth. Pray and ask for it as you normally talk to your friend. But now we want to ask, what about when you want to pray and you don't know what to pray? Now does the Holy Spirit say you have to say this or that in a certain amount of time? You have to pray six to seven times a day, otherwise I won't hear you? If you don't know what to pray, it's too bad, I won't listen? No. Romans chapter 8 verse 26 says, Likewise, the Spirit also helps our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought. But the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. So this is how much God desires our good. The Spirit of God knows the deep things in our lives which we don't even know of, or we know but don't mention. The word used is intercession with groanings. So you can imagine how the Spirit is, or you can imagine how the Holy Spirit is praying for you on your behalf. To say the Holy Spirit intercedes with groanings is to say he feels your pain. He knows what you're going through and he even comes in and pleads in your stead. The Holy Spirit is like, you could say, a lawyer who actually desires our good rather than your own typical lawyer who's just paid to do a job. Now this is not to say that we should not pray because in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 17 it says pray without ceasing. But when we pray, the Holy Spirit cooperates with our prayers. As the, you allow the Holy Spirit to pray with you, it shows the earnestness of how God wants you in his life and he wants to transform and change to make everything come out smoothly, even in the rough times. So, what are we to do to please God? Now with this question, there are many methods which people take on to try and please God. Some believe you have to repeat a passage over and over again. Some even go as fanatical as abuse yourself by cutting yourself, beating yourself. And even some believe that you have to do a certain amount of works in order to please God or to make you righteous. But Romans chapter 8 verse 5 says, For they that are of the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are of the spirit the things of the spirit. So, we see a contrast, and that is the spirit and the flesh. Now, what do these metaphors mean? Romans chapter 8 verse 6, 
For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. That word enmity means hate. So in other words, because the carnal mind hates God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then, they that are of the flesh cannot please God. So what the Bible is saying is that to be carnally minded is the same as being fleshly minded. Now remember, we just talked about the metaphors, the flesh and the spirit. Now the word carnal is the same in connection to flesh. So, to be spiritually minded means to have the spirit of God in your mind, which brings life. So what pleases God is his spirit removing death from your life and replacing it with life. And as he is placing life into you, you become a new person, a person who is free from sin. So, to be carnally minded is death. To be spiritually minded is life. So God wants to take away the carnal mind so that you can have life. Isn't that amazing? God's pleasure is to see you live. So to put it in a straightforward way, God's pleasure, like I just said, is to see you live and not die. And that remedy, through his gift, is given to you, the Holy Spirit. So as we allow this experience to take place, what change will take place? Ezekiel chapter 36 verse 26 says, A new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will put Oh, sorry, I will take away the stony heart of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and ye shall keep my judgments and do them. So the changes that take place is a new heart, a heart of flesh from before having a heart of stone which indicates you were once in a hardened part in your life but now you are free. Now I hope this makes sense. So it is to say that I was hardened. I would never have accepted this truth. But because my heart is softened, I'm more willing to accept it. Now it also says in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 15, Whereof the Holy Ghost also is a witness to us. For after that ye had said before, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds I will write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. So once you had this experience, not only are you transformed, but you have a clean slate. So imagine this, you ask God to forgive you of your sins, but there may come a time that you still feel guilty of that sin that you committed years ago and not even feel guilty but you just want to say I'm sorry again do you know what the Lord's reply is he says what are you talking about I don't remember you doing this sin whatever you did you asked for forgiveness and now it's gone I can't remember what you've done this is the level and how God wants to make us whole many people today remind us of what we did in our past and it hurts to think that they recall your past, but God never does that. He removes your past and gives you a new life. When you are recalled of your sins, when you think about the things you've done in your past experience, it is the devil that is reminding you of these things. But God has already forgiven you, so you can have peace and rest. Now there is a story in the Bible which Jesus taught, and this demonstrates the work of the Holy Spirit in convicting us to come to God. Now, I'll just briefly sum it up, but you can read it through in um, Luke chapter 15, verse 11 to 24. There was a man who had two sons, and as time went on, the younger son said that he wanted his share of what belonged to him. So once he had his share, he moved out and went on his way. Now he spent the money 
on his pleasures and lost absolutely everything. 